Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you with us. If you are a first-time listener, welcome to the program and welcome to our community. Glad to have you with us. Uh, a couple things I always ask of our new listeners. Number one, uh, please do uh, subscribe so you can get all the updates. Um, two, visit the rexandrewshow.com. And the reason I suggest that is we are a biography show and we tell people stories, but we don't catch it all. So on the show website, um, you can find biographies and um, information, connections, uh, links, all that good stuff to our guests. So all of our previous guests, our upcoming guests, and our current guests today. There's about 60 in the queue coming up. So we always have a great list of people that are coming onto the show. So do that. And then the last thing, I'm not bashful. I will beg. In fact, I have a caller on today. So I am a well-dressed beggar. Um, I would like to have you give us those five stars. So if you like what we're doing, give us those star ratings. It helps us for placement in these in the podcast app store. So fantastic. If you are a existing listener, welcome back. We know you have so many choices for podcasts out there. You know, there's, I don't know, everybody talks about the numbers. Some people say two and a half million, some people over three million, but let's just face it. There's a ton of content out there. You have lots of choices. So thank you. And we're glad to have you back as listeners. We have listeners in 32 countries across six continents in more than 520 cities. So it's exciting to have people on the show with us. And a little feature that I do each day is the fact that we like to list, uh, welcome in listeners. And so I would like to welcome those who are listening in Syracuse, New York. So thank you very much for uh, tuning in. All right, let's get on with it. Uh, you uh, understand the game here. If you listen to our show, if you haven't, it's a biography show. Interesting people doing interesting things. Um, I'm the one that always learns the most because I got fascinating uh, guests doing great things. So let me uh, introduce our guest today. It's, I'm excited about this one. I've never had somebody that does exactly what he does. He does, does. Wow, listen to that. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, he's a husband and a father and a grandfather. So uh, those are three roles that are awesome. And I am all three of those. So I understand those things. Love it. Um, he's a podcaster. Uh, he is actually a podcast uh, you know, for the Tog Chat Photography, which is his podcast that he does. So it's always good to have a peer on the show. And then this is something very, uh, very interesting, very unique. And we'll get into what he does today. He's an Olympus visionary photographer. So uh, he's fantastic. He's out there. This guy, Joe, um, <laughs> is out there. So welcome to the show, Joe Edelman. Joe, how are you today? I'm doing great, Rex. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. You know, good to have you with us. Now, as you know, you've listened to a show or two. It's it's your story. So it's it's easy mm -hmm. to prep. You know, I don't have to ask yep. all these funny questions. So we like to go back in time to understand the influences that you've had that got you where you are today. Uh, life yep. is a journey. Uh, success doesn't fall out of the sky. Now, earlier this year, uh, sure. right here in the Denver area, we had airplane parts fall out of the sky uh, and crush some stuff and land in parks. So that was only three yep. blocks from my house. So wow. but su success doesn't do that. Success. Though. Right. Well, there was a United <laughs> Airlines flight that was headed to Honolulu that uh, the engine uh, blew yep. up and caught saw that fire. on the news. Yeah. So, yep. yep, that was three blocks from my house where those parts landed. So anyway. Uh, All wow. right. So let's get uh, get going here. And we'll ask you some serious questions. You don't have to worry about ask, uh, rewriting them down because I'll fire them off to you. We want to know mm -hmm. where you were born. OK. We also want to know where you grew up because those are different and can be different influences. I had, for example, a lady on the show, Ellie Soja. I reference her every time. It's one of the most unique grow up experiences. She moved 63 times before the age of 15. So hmm. she was the daughter of an international con man. So it's a great episode to listen hmm. for Ellie Soja. Um, we also want to know um, about your family. So if you have siblings and if you do have siblings, did they survive your harassment? We want to know about your parents. Okay. So. Yep. Uh, your we parental influence is huge, not only about the types of jobs that they have or, or the things that they did, but parental influence after me interviewing hundreds of people, I have found that the kind of three buckets. The first bucket is the super supportive launch parents. So totally engaged and pushed you along and supported you in every way that they could. The second bucket, sort of the middle bucket where of course they love their kids but they just didn't have enough time to be fully engaged because they were eking out a living, okay? And then the third one is the other, is the struggle bucket. And that's a, an environment where kids grew up where 
it wasn't a great environment. So that could be uh, issues with addiction, abuse, extreme poverty, massive dysfunction. And so what happens with people there that I interview is they overcome those things. So they kind of have a mentality of, hey, I don't want to be anything like this and I'm going to do different. All right, then we're going to pop around a little bit in your education. We also want to know about things that you did as a kid. So if you grew up and if you were in sports or theater, dance, and in fact, I had a, a guest who was a shoplifter, then by the age of 15, he was a car thief. So uh, huh. yeah, there are different things we focus on. Then we'll hop around again, like education, and then some life experiences, some pivot points, and then we'll end up sure. with what you're doing today as a Olympus visionary photographer. I mean, it's uh, pretty interesting stuff. I have a lot of questions ar around the different types of photography. Um, someone who's built a uh, technology over the last uh, 34 years, People don't understand just taking uh, old crazy pictures and post them on your website. That doesn't work. You know, you have to have things yep. that are the right product. So let's get it going here, Joe. Where were you born? I was born in a, well, what was a small town, about 30 minutes outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The town's name is Lansdale. Okay. Well, I'm, I guess I'm not familiar with Lansdale. Where in geographic reference is that to Philadelphia? North, south, east, west? Um, that's a northwest suburb in Montgomery County. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so then were you raised there? Did you grow up there then also? Yep, I grew up there, uh, spent the first 18 years of my life there. Um, I was an only child, so I had it pretty easy. Um, blue collar upbringing. Uh, okay. My father was, um, essentially he was an engineer, but not by degree. Uh, he worked in factories, uh, managed big pieces of equipment and designed and created big pieces of equipment. My mother was a secretary, uh, receptionist at an ophthalmologist's office. Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, would you kind of categorize that as a maybe a middle bucket or what was the environment yeah I, based on your descriptions i would definitely say you know middle bucket um my you know my parents were of modest means um i was very fortunate when i got into photography um my mother thought it was a bit crazy because she of course realized it was going to get expensive yeah um my father was the problem solver type so he okay. was very good at uh finding doors to open okay. and creating opportunities because he couldn't give me the things. Okay. So he, you know, he really taught me a lot of what really turned out to be the groundwork for my entrepreneurial spirit. Fantastic. Now, what did you uh, do as a kid growing up? So what type of interests did you do? Uh, you know, as a young kid, I was really just pretty much a young kid. I mean, in my generation, you know, we get up in the morning, eat breakfast and we were out of the house until dinner time. But yep. Exactly. Um, I got into photography very early. I was 11 okay. years old. Um, people frequently ask me what got you into photography and my running joke is I did it to piss off my parents. <laughs> I had, I, as an only child, I had a great deal by the time I was, I don't know, maybe nine years old or so where mm -hmm. the Christmas catalogs would come every year and I could pick one gift that was expensive, like, you know, up to about a hundred dollars. So sure. like one year I got a record player. Okay. that type of thing right and i was 11 years old the sears and robot christmas catalog showed yeah. up and i had always been fascinated by my parents eight millimeter movie camera but was never allowed to touch it right so flipping through the the catalog when it came i skipped right past the toys because i didn't need any toys right and i got to the section with cameras and there was a german camera it was a hanamex practica camera it was 75 dollars a 35 millimeter camera oh, wow. movie cameras were still out of my price range but this, this camera was in my price range. And I got to tell you, Rex, it looked cool. <laughs> so sure. I decided that's what I want. Ran to my mom, showed her the catalog, and took her practically a split second. No, definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> so went to my father. I thought, okay, he'll, he'll be more rational. And he's like, nah, that's not a good idea. Because in their defense, I was one of those kids that would get into a hobby, had to have everything, everything. And then I would get bored. I right. moved to a new hobby. So they, <laughs> they could see the, you know, the writing on the wall, essentially. And finally, after a lot of whining, my father said, you know, you've got money in the bank. You've been saving to buy a minibike. So if you want the camera bad enough, take your money and go get it. And sure enough, the next day I did. I went to the bank with my little 
passbook for my savings account. Oh yeah. Got I my those. got my money out and went to the camera store and paid cash for my first camera. And that was the beginning of it. You know, they didn't, you know, when you talked about eight millimeter, my my parents mm -hmm. we did a ton of those and we had to convert them at one point in time. But I can remember the days of you know, feeding the film through the projector and all sure. those things. Now, yeah. back when you got your first camera, they really didn't even talk about it in the industry. What type of pixels were they at that time? Did they? No, nah, there, there was no pixel. I mean, you basically, right. the, the film equivalent right, it's was film. Uh, film format. So yeah. you had 35 millimeter film, you had medium format, which was 120. That was the square negatives. Mm -hmm. And then you get up into the sheet films, the 4x5, 5x7, 8x10. Right. Yeah, I even had, I think we're roughly around the same age. I even had a, um, a photography class and we would go out and take the pictures and then develop the film and, you know, darkroom yep. stuff and all that fun mm -hmm. things. And so, yeah, I have a little bit of exposure to that world. Okay. Yep. So uh, when you were finished um, with high school, what was your next hop? Uh, right out of high school, I took a job. I was really very fortunate. I had gotten uh, a full ride to the University of Missouri, which wow. in the late 1970s was basically, if you were going to get into photojournalism, you either went to Missouri or you went to Kent State in Ohio. It was, it was okay. one of the two. They were the, the two big photojournalism schools. And I had applied for what I thought was a part-time job at a small town newspaper near where I grew up, Quakertown, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and um, went for the interview the day after... I graduated high school and sitting in this editor's office, he was a little old, kind of very Italian guy with a big bushy mustache and he's right. stroking his mustache the whole time he's talking to me and he opens up my portfolio, looks at the first page, looks at the second page, and then he just closes it. At which point I'm thinking, okay, I guess I'm not working for the summer. Yeah, right. I'm <laughs> and, done, huh? And then he, he sits there for a minute brushing his mustache a little bit more. And then he says to me, when can you start? I'm like, oh, tomorrow. Like, wow. it's great. But then he starts talking to me about benefits and salary. And I'm, you know, an 18 year old punk kid. I got no idea. Right. So I, finally I had to stop him. I'm like, I get all of this for a part-time job. And he sits up in his chair, like really irritated. He's like, what do you mean part-time job? I thought you were here for the chief photographer's job. Oh my goodness. So I'm like, four years to do this. Yep. That was the end of that conversation. So I took the job and never looked back. Never looked back. Okay. Yep. So looking back across all your formative years, you know, clear up to finishing high school, early 20s and stuff, setting aside your parents. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you were a single kid, you don't have to set aside siblings. Was right. there someone else who made a big impact in your life? Oh, gosh, a, co yes. a coach, yeah. a teacher. Was there just somebody Absolutely. that stands out in your mind? Uh, there's a couple of them. I, okay. I mean, let's face it. Any any successful person, you don't do it on your own. No. Uh, it, it's a joke to think you did it on your own. I mean, it, it really did start with my father. He was okay. um, he was a person that really opened a lot of doors. I was a very shy kid. But starting in seventh grade in school, uh, it began with a math teacher who happened to be the advisor for the yearbook. Mm -hmm. who made me take pictures for the yearbook because in a rather immature way, I used to take the camera to school because it looked cool. Uh -huh. And literally one day I walked in, walked, in, walked in a math class and he slams two rolls of film down on my desk. Well, at that age, two rolls of film, that's like gold. Yeah, exactly. And I looked at him, I'm like, what's this for? And he literally, which of course a teacher couldn't say this day, but he's like, you bring that damn camera to my class every single day and I never see you use it. Go use it for the yearbook. Wow. And so I asked him what to take pictures of. He's like, whatever you want. So I took two rolls of film and went back a couple days later, gave him the film. He developed them. I hadn't gotten a darkroom yet. And he comes back a day later and I go into class and he gives me a three by five card and another roll of film. And he wow. said, here's your first assignment for the yearbook. And I read the card and it was to take pictures of some club after school. Okay. It was mostly ninth graders in this club. I'm in seventh grade. Yeah. These kids don't talk to me. I'm a shy kid. I sure. panicked. I was panic stricken. <laughs> so the that day school ends. I, you know, meekishly get to the room and I was scared to death to go in and I'm peeking through the window. And it was just like in the movies. Everybody's running around and yelling and it's like party time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I can't go in. And finally somebody walks out and sees me with a camera, turns around and he goes, Hey, the photographer's here. 
and everybody stops and everybody was happy. It's like, what do you want us to do? We're ready. And that was the moment where I had this awareness of like, wow, people will talk to me with a camera. Ah. So that was the first kind of turning point. And then I had an art teacher in middle school who um, really went out of his way. As I was in ninth grade, the uh, gentleman that taught photography in the high school that I went to, he was retiring. So I was not going to, he was the one that built the program. I was not going to have the opportunity to have him as a teacher. Right. And he had graduated a string of students who went on to uh, work for the Associated Press, National Geographic. Um, so this gentleman actually drove me to the high school one day after school to meet this, um, this teacher uh, to have him, you know, kind of look at my work and, and give me some feedback. And even that particular teacher who was retiring, um, the meeting that I had with him really, it was very brief and I never did get to have him as a teacher, but he gave me an assignment to do, which I thought he was nuts. <laughs> had no intention of doing it but right. fortunately a couple weeks later it kind of all started to make sense and that really changed my entire outlook and understanding of lighting and how light works right um and then in high school uh i was very very fortunate that and it's kind of right place right time yeah. um my school district was a wealthier school district they and this is again you know mid 1970s they were a school district that had already figured out the importance of public relations okay so they had a public relations uh director and a you know a whole team mm -hmm. i started doing photography for them mm -hmm. um while i was still in high school they would have me going to different schools in the school district they connected me with a local newspaper i started doing work for the local newspaper um so these folks were big supporters and really kind of pushed me out to get me opportunities. And then even within my high school itself, my principal and my teachers, I had a great deal. If the school district needed me to shoot something in an elementary school, I'd get a phone call from the PR department and say, hey, don't go to school tomorrow morning, be at this elementary school. And so I go to the elementary school first, then I go to school, pick up with my classes. And it was a real simple deal. They said, look, whatever you do, Keep the grades up as long as you keep the grades up and we know where you're at we're not worried about you missing classes or this my teachers were supportive my principal was supportive and i managed to keep the grades up so it worked out Fantastic. so i i had a lot of people that really had big impacts and for each of them it was probably a very small thing in their life but the fact is they each went out of their way a little bit to do something that really created you know, tremendous opportunity and if nothing else, tremendous learning opportunities for me. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your mom. Was she a stay home mom? Did she work? I mean, what, did, what was her environment? Her well, my mother was, my mother was British. She okay. uh, was a world war II baby, grew up in the East end of London. Okay. Um, she was one of 13 children. Wow. Um, she was a stay at home mom until I was about nine years old. And that's when she went to work as a receptionist for mm -hmm. an ophthalmologist office um very british uh very particular very set in her ways mm -hmm. um she was really kind of the boss of the family in that regard okay um but um yeah she was um uh, you know also for the time period uh, you know kind of very typical in terms of a parent that you know was very very supportive but there was the expectation that you were going to meet certain standards sure you know and, and so uh, in, in that regard, I actually consider myself to be very, very lucky because that, you know, really kind of taught me the responsibility behind doing that. Yeah, it's a different world today, isn't it? It's crazy. Yes, it's absolutely. very different. So um, help me out a little bit. Uh, how long did you work for the newspaper? So the first newspaper that I went to, uh, I was there for five years. Okay. And, um, and you were the chief photographer, right? I was, yes. <laughs> I, I had I had three photographers working underneath me. Wow. Uh, who were all older than me. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have to give them a lot of credit too because they actually, they had a lot to do with shaping um, just really my skill set and, and my ability because I knew nothing about supervising people, yeah. motivating people, um, right. you know, working with people that were older than me. 
Um, and there were probably plenty of times where they probably should have just kicked me out the door to be really honest, <laughs> because I was, you know, young and cocky and really had no idea. Yeah. But these guys were great. They, you know, they were very good at kind of being able to put me in my place without putting me in my place. If mm -hmm. you know, if you will. Um, so yeah, they also were very helpful. Yeah. It's funny when you look back, um, when you're that in the mix of it at that point in time, you don't really realize how much you don't know. You're walking around as an unconscious incompetent. You know, you don't even know yep. what you don't know. Sure. But when you look back in your, you know, older years, it's like, wow, I was an idiot back then. Or, yep. you know, it's too oh, bad. Believe me. Yeah, I had at, no idea. At 18 to 20 years old, I that, that's the perfect description of me, Rex, right yeah. there. <laughs> you just, you know, that yeah. was the perfect description of me. I had had some success early. I had won a bunch of awards. I thought I was the bomb. Oh, yeah. And I literally, as I look back, I have absolutely no clue. And I can tell you the editor of my newspaper probably should have fired me about 10 times over. <laughs> but fortunately, I was talented and I worked my butt off. So it kind of balanced Bounced and out. they tolerated it. But yeah, you know, you talk about things you wish you could do over and do better. That mm -hmm. was definitely a piece of my life that I wish I could have done better. Well, you know, it's interesting when I'm, I'm thinking through uh, your journey you know, I've, I've interviewed a ton of people through radio and podcasting mm -hmm. and um, you're one of only a handful that I've ever met that got into their career, not only just an interest, but their basically their career starting at the age of 11. That's, that's uh, yeah. very unique. I was very lucky. I mean, honestly, I really was. I, you know, I still tell people to be clear. I'm 61 now. Mm -hmm. I still don't know, which this is a struggle. I still don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up. I'm still yep. working on that. Yeah. I know, however, that it will involve a camera for sure. For sure. And, and that's been the thread. But yeah, I got the camera at 11 and I had my, my first picture was published in a newspaper at 14, just kind of by dumb luck. Wow. But that was the moment that kind of sealed the deal. Sealed the deal. Came home from school and my picture was on the bottom of the front page with my name, my byline underneath it. So nice. the 14 year old version of me looks at the byline where it says photo by Joe Edelman. And then looks at the masthead at the top of the paper where underneath the name of the paper, it says read by 22,000 daily. So the 14 oh, yeah. year old mind is like 22,000 people know that I took that picture. <laughs> right. Uh, that's awesome. And that was, that was it. That was, was you know, it was kind of, and a lot of photographers start that way. It's that chase for the byline. Yeah. And that was it. So, yeah. So did your creative side, uh, roll into other aspects of your life because you know you have to be creative and have an eye for photography not everybody you can do. do it right so yeah. whether well, was that creativity and that eye for capturing things did that impact any other areas of your life oh it's it's always been there but i was an idiot when i was younger i'm sure. not gonna lie um yeah. I, I remember actually being in high school and my mother at some family gathering or some event um was doing a rare kind of proud mama moment. My mother wasn't a big one for kind of public displays of that. Again, very sure. traditional British, mm -hmm. but she made a statement about how creative I was. And I was like an idiot. I was insulted because <laughs> I was, I was pursuing a career in photojournalism where it's news. Right. right. And right. even then I had this perspective that all photojournalism was pure truth, which it's not only in a sense, no conspiracy stuff. It's only, only in the sense that as the photographer, you actually have a lot of control and a lot of choice. You can aim the camera to the left. You can aim it to the right. You can aim it forward. You can aim it backward. So it's only the truth that you choose to photograph at that moment. But Correct. this idea of creativity wasn't a part of my thought process. Um, my father is, is the person that not by trying, but by watching him, mm -hmm. he defined what has really been throughout my life, my definition of creativity. Mm -hmm. Too many people associate creativity with art and being artistic. Right. And it's really not. In fact, if you look at the science and the research that's been done, of which there's a ton at this point, a ton of research on creativity, uh, the way that I like to define creativity, if you will, it's essentially it's connecting the dots. It's solving problems. Okay. Right? And as photographers, that's what we do. We say, oh, I want to take a picture of that. But no photographer ever just wants a snapshot. They want an epic image. Exactly. So every time they have that thought, hey, let's take a picture, they're essentially creating a problem. Mm -hmm. How do I create something that's unique, 
and interesting and visually stimulating. Right. So it solved that problem. And my father was the problem solver type. He could fix anything. If somebody had a problem, he was the guy that would figure out a solution. When I really got hooked on photography, I, you know, they didn't have the money to hand me the gear. And I was too young to be able to get a job that was going to get me the gear. My father went much against my mother's best wishes and took out a loan to buy a riding lawnmower because he worked at a factory. And at the factory that he worked at, he knew the man who owned the industrial park where this factory was. So he talked this guy into giving us the contract to cut all the grass for the industrial park. Oh, wow. So literally for three years, like after school in the summers, I would run a riding mower and cut grass and that paid for my camera gear. By the time I was 16, my father had also gone to school with a guy who worked for the Philadelphia Inquirer, one of the biggest papers in the country yeah, at the absolutely. time. He was, yeah. he was about to retire from that job. Um, so he was selling off all his gear. So I was able to buy all of his used gear. Nice. And as a 16 year old, I had like a full kit of Nikon equipment, which was very expensive and I wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise. So my father was the kind of the connect the dots guy mm -hmm. and never in the sense of art or creativity. Mm -hmm. It was always in a sense of problem solving. If, you know, if there's a problem, let's figure out a way to solve it. And that's kind of what stuck with <clears throat> me. Okay. And that's really what has always driven my creative thinking. When I look at someone, let's say like a fashion designer that cre or, or an artist that creates a painting, an abstract painting, especially, I look at things like that and I'm very jealous of those people because my mind doesn't work in that way. Um, but in my recent years, let's say the last 10 years with my photography, the fashion portraiture that I do is where I've really kind of pushed myself to say, okay, what can I do that's kind of completely counterintuitive that makes no sense because why does it have to make sense? Mm -hmm. But yet it's still visually interesting. It's going to stop people in their tracks and make them look at it and make them pay attention to it. So more recently in my life, I've kind of embraced that side of creativity and, okay. and, and trying to kind of create something from nothing. Right. But that was not my real strength creatively growing up. It was really more a matter of problem solving. Okay. A lot of my creativity evolved around psychology. Psychology. Because as a newspaper photographer, you essentially, you were walking into other people's lives, effectively, let's say figuratively, 10 minutes at a time. Yeah. But you were generally experiencing these people at the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, of lows. Yep. in their lives. So you know, really paying attention to people, learning to read people, uh, being able to manipulate people to a degree in, in terms of being able to get what you needed out of them. That became kind of really the true art form for me at first. It was, you know, really learning that aspect of it. Right. So um, how long did you stay in newspaper photography? So not long enough. I, I, only, I only stayed professionally. I only stayed in it after I graduated high school for about six years. Okay. Um, I married very young, first okay. time around. Yeah. Um, I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. We got off to a rocky start. Um, we were too young, plain and simple. Um, and we did what many people did at that generation. And we thought, well, let's start a family. Uh, so the good news is, you know, I, I got a wonderful son who is incredibly successful today, but, um, newspaper was a lifestyle for me. And so sure. it definitely wasn't helping the relationship. <clears throat> so I decided really out of frustration, okay, time to make a change yep. because if I was going to grow my newspaper business, it was only going to get harder on the family and not easier. Right. So I decided I would open a portrait and wedding business and oh, wow. literally just left the newspaper business. I had done some portrait and wedding work, mm -hmm. not a lot. Uh, so I was, shall we say, competent, but not great at it. Right. But I was never afraid of a learning curve and I had a solid foundation in photography. So I dove okay. in, um, started the business, um, pretty much failed, but didn't give up. And okay. once again, you know, through the blessings of a couple of people that came into my life, got some guidance and mm -hmm. turned things around and wound up with a, a very successful business after Fantastic. a couple of years. So, well, that's a journey. Everybody that starts a business. You know, you yep. fumble around and you're still in that unconscious incompetence that, you know, stage yep. doing oh, absolutely. Like that. Yeah. But, yep. you know, the key thing is you kept trying. So yep. um, how long were you married the first time? 
Uh, first time we were together for six years. Six years. Okay. Married for six years. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you had a lot of things changing right at one time when, you know, leaving the paper, yep. starting your own business. Yep. A lot. And Absolutely. A lot of turmoil. So yep. um, this is just a weird question. And again, mm -hmm. um, you know, when it comes to photography, there are mainly three big dogs in the industry, or at least from the retail business. There's Nikon, mm -hmm. Canon and Olympus. Did you pick being an Olympus guy clear back then, or have you hopped around? I mean, it's, oh, no. it's, it's kind of like being a, you know, religion, you know, or, or right. politics, you know, I'm either Democrat yep. or Republican or independent. So tell yep. us a little bit about that. Well, so there's, so just to be fair to everybody, there's, there's more than three big players at this point, but yeah. um, I actually was a Nikon guy for 42 years. Wow. Started as a Nikon guy, um, never looked that any other brands had no interest in any other sure. brands. Sure. Um, when digital technology came along, I still was a Nikon guy. I adopted digital technology in the year 2000 when Nikon came out with the very first of all the professional digital cameras. Yeah. But um, around about, I guess, oh, probably we're talking 2011 or 2012. I may be off by a year or two there. Yeah. Um, Sony came to market with mirrorless yeah. digital cameras. Okay. Uh, what made the mirrorless digital cameras special was the fact that they didn't have that clunky mirror that had to flip up out of the way. Yep, yep. And what that meant was that when you looked into the camera, you weren't actually looking through the lens, which is what you did in film cameras and the sure. early digital cameras. You were looking essentially at a TV screen. Uh, the technical term is EVF, electronic viewfinder. Right. But what that meant, the really cool thing about that is, when you looked through the viewfinder, you were seeing the finished picture with uh, the exposure applied, with the amount of depth of field that you were going to have. Like that was your finished shot. So if it's too light or too dark, there's, you know, obviously it's not like in the film days where you take a picture and you wait seven days to find out you yeah. suck. So you knew, <laughs> you knew right away. And even compared to the early digital cameras where you would take the picture and then immediately put the camera down in front of you, press the play button to yeah. see it. None of that. It, you knew Instant. when you shot the, the image, what my exposure is correct. Like. There yeah. it is. So the early mirrorless cameras, they had what's referred to as a lag. You would push the button and there was a little bit of a delay before it actually recorded the image. Mm -hmm. That made it a challenge for professional photographers, especially for anybody shooting like sports or something yeah, like that. Yeah. That problem has been eliminated today. But for me, what was happening was the, the mirrorless technology was getting better. Mm -hmm. I really, really wanted to go mirrorless. Okay. Nikon, unfortunately, uh, really dragged their feet. They were one of the, the last companies to, you know, get a mirrorless really system there. out there. Yeah. I tried Sony. Uh, they're good cameras. I just didn't like the ergonomics. Um, literally by chance, I started hearing things about Olympus. I was using a similar format camera uh, made by Panasonic for my That's video, right. for my yeah. YouTube videos. Yeah. So finally, I decided to rent an Olympus camera and just try it out and literally fell in love with it. And the irony of all of that, all this time that I'm considering Olympus cameras, which I never considered Olympus cameras previously, but I live 12 minutes from their corporate headquarters in the United States <laughs> <laughs> and never, never considered the brand until I had one in my hands. And yeah, then that's it. So I, I made the switch. I'd never looked back. Well, yeah, that's right. I hadn't even, for, I forgot about those other brands because you'd had Panasonic mm -hmm. and Sony and so yeah, Panasonic's lot. out there. Sony Fujifilm has a great yeah, line Fuji, of cameras yeah, now yeah. as well. So, so the good news is, you know, there's, there's quite a few choices out there for photographers. And I think right. we're going to see even more changes in that industry over the next 10 years. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of new technology that's coming out as fast and furious right now. Well, it's interesting, you know, for someone who doesn't know anything about photography, I've got a daughter that's into it, but um, you know, people are walking around with, with these, uh, uh, Galaxy, you know, the Samsung phones that sure. have a 64 pixels. You got iPhones that yep. are up there too. So people yep. are walking around with some pretty powerful tools. And, yep. and I know when I open up my Galaxy uh, S20, there's all these features and functions. I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I, I kind of yep. treat it as an SLR almost. It's just basically yeah. point and shoot and, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. But, uh, mm -hmm. yep. but it's interesting now because, you know, 
there's so much more photography and video video shot these days because sure. everybody's walking around with one in their pocket. Yep. And they're extremely high quality and extremely capable from a feature set, which yeah. is awesome. It's absolutely awesome. The barrier to entry into photography as a hobby or for that matter, a profession, it's almost non-existent compared to what it was, yeah. you know, 40, 50 years ago, which is yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah, I can still remember developing film in the junior high school <laughs> yep. dark room and the red lights yep. and no lights and mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. So yep. a question for you along the way in the types of photography, mm -hmm. and I know you had a studio and stuff. What the, yep. Did you do other types of stuff? You talked about some yeah. uh, modeling. Uh, I did. What? So after I did the portrait and wedding stuff, I started, uh, you know, again, it, it's, it was all kind of just a just a natural migration if you will. i don't want to say natural as in that's what everybody would do but natural in the sense it, it just led from one thing to the next while i was doing the portrait and wedding work i picked up one or two clients where i was doing uh basically like sports teams little leagues dance okay. schools things yep. like that which are kind of volume shooting that were actually yeah. really good money yeah and that allowed me to not take as many weddings be a little bit more particular about the weddings but then while i was doing that i stumbled on a client who needed some uh food photography done which i'd never done before but yeah i dove in and did it even bought a four by five sheet film camera to start working with started to really really enjoy that was having a ton of fun with it started doing more commercial advertising work and product mm -hmm. work really kind of missed the people element yeah. because everything I had done to that point in my career was photographing people. And um, that tended to be that work, the commercial advertising work tended to be kind of very solo. Yeah. So um, from there, stumbled onto a client who was, and this was in the mid 1980s, was a fashion designer who was designing um, designer leotards. So this is in the flash dance era. The name of okay. her business was Leotardo da Vinci. <laughs> um, so, um, and she was desperate, needed a photographer in a hurry. And I was like, yeah, I can do it. I'd never shot fashion before, but like, you know, that was kind of my, my ongoing thing. It's like, fake it till you make it. Just do it. It sure. sounded interesting. Just do it. Right. So I did the first shoot with her, had a blast. Everything went really, really well. Uh, a couple of the images were published in a few magazines. So then started doing a lot of fashion work and then was doing some fashion layouts for some regional kind of entertainment magazines and things like that. That led to doing modeling portfolios. And so it's all been this kind of, you know, ongoing Progression. set of transitions. But aside from the brief time doing food and commercial advertising product work, which is about three years, it's always involved people. People have always been the thread. Yeah, I know. I've I've been building websites for a long time. I don't even want to consider and mobile applications. Mm -hmm. And we would have clients send us photos. And we're like, I can't use this. It's junk, you know. And right. you you need to go get a professional and get you know some yep. pictures because, you know, taking pictures of static things, you know, especially like food and products and stuff. Sure. That's a whole different discipline than I'm taking pictures Absolutely. of landscapes or our people and stuff. Now, I have to ask this because my mind goes there. You know, it's really funny that you talked about doing the sports teams and that stuff. My daughter just picked up a, a job doing that and they pay great. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. she'll go and shoot, uh, you know, hundreds of kids at a soccer, you know, field and stuff mm -hmm. like that as far as the the photos, you know, the profile photos and the team yep. photos and that kinds of stuff. So, yeah, and sure. it's, a, it's a good place to do a lot of transactional, uh, you know, high volume type stuff. So did yeah, you ever get into, with the modeling and stuff, did you ever get into some risky stuff as far as, you know, things that were, they were modeling risky type stuff? Uh, well, I mean, I've shot fine art nudes. I shot boudoir, I shot that type of stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, um, I think any, oh, I, let me rephrase that. I think most photographers that go down that path, male or female photographer for that sure, matter. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I think it's an area that you, you know, you wind up exploring. Um, certainly I think a lot of it has to do also with kind of who you are personally, where you're at in your life. It mm -hmm. just so happened at the time that I was first starting to do modeling portfolios and that type of work, I was also single. Uh, um, okay. yeah. so I, you know, wasn't dealing with that having any impacts on a relationship, that yeah. type of thing. So mm -hmm. that made it a little bit easier. 
Um, my wife at this point, I'm blessed. She is very supportive of it. Even the fine art nude work, she thinks the work that I do is great. I don't get to shoot it that often, yeah. but every now and then that's, you know, that's kind of, um, it, it's been like a little side project that one of these years I would love to do a little gallery exhibit with some of my work. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, I think the key to that is at least for me, it was always to kind of have a, a, a plan and a concept. Um, the whole idea, like a lot of times people are like, wow, like, you know, like photographing a naked chick or <laughs> some girl in lingerie is like really cool. <clears throat> and, and the reality of it is it's cool for about three and a half seconds. Yeah. Because after that you realize, yes, it's there's just... a naked person standing in front of me and I need to be respectful and I need to try and create art. And it's actually incredibly awkward. So again, yeah. it comes back to that 80% psychology where you've actually got to work really hard to make it not awkward yeah. and, you know, to really make it about the process and, and about the creativity. So, uh, yeah, it's not like you're just kind of gawking at somebody <laughs> and enjoying, the, enjoying the view. Enjoying the view. Uh, sure. yeah, look, I'm not going to say, Hey, it's painful and it's horrible, but no, it's actually a lot more work than, than people perceive. At least if you respect other people, sure. it's a lot more work than people perceive. You know? oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. Fantastic. So uh, when did you get into podcasting? And then the second one is when did you start with education? Because I know you're an educator in this field. So yep. tell us. So about actually, that. I'm going to I'm going to answer those in reverse because then okay. it'll make yeah. sense. Yep. Um, I started um, I, I did my first ever kind of presentation, if you will. It's probably just over 10 years ago now. And okay. I was kind of reluctant. I had this thought process of who's going to want to listen to me. But the gentleman that was running the event was insistent. You have to come in and do a demo. And it went really, really well. And I had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So I started accepting more requests to do some teaching. And then finally, we're at about, I guess, six years now. Um, I was again at another one of those points in my career where it's like, all right, I like what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I was making my living shooting modeling portfolios, acting headshots, doing very well. Mm -hmm but had been doing that for a while and could also see the beginnings of that industry changing right. and the needs changing. And just kind of started looking for something, you know, to really kind of keep my interest going and mm -hmm. reaching a point also where I was really attracted to the idea of not really having to answer to clients because right. obviously my whole career, I had you know, been dealing with clients. Mm -hmm. So the idea of teaching came along and YouTube was a thing at this yep. point. And I had like anybody else in photography, I had been, you know, looking around to see what was on YouTube and what people were doing and found most of the videos very frustrating mm -hmm. um, because there wasn't really a lot of solid education. There was a lot of people instructing, saying, right. do this, do that, do this, or just talking about gear, none of which actually teaches you about photography. Right. So I thought, you know what? There's an opportunity here. So on a whim, uh, and when I say a whim, I, I put together a business model, but it was kind of like, this is crazy at my age, but let's try this. I started the YouTube channel with the goal being build critical mass in the YouTube channel. Critical mass on YouTube is get to 100,000 subscribers. Right. And essentially using that to market my teaching abilities for workshops, presentations, et cetera, and essentially become a full-time educator. So... Turns out, after all these years of photography, I'm probably a better educator than I am a photographer. Oh, really? And I'm very proud of that fact. I really am. Well, you know, I, as a photographer, I'm good. My strength is solid foundation of the technical aspects of it and attention to detail. When you look at my images, you don't see things out of place or sloppy. You don't see poles growing out of people's heads. You don't see right. hair out of place. I'm a detail freak. That's been my strength. And I've been able to pay my bills for my whole lifetime. But... I'm never going to be looked at as an iconic photographer or like the most amazing photographer. And, and I understand that that's, that's not being modest. That's just the reality of it. Yeah. Teaching, teaching is something where I've literally been able to really kind of establish myself in the photography space as somebody that doesn't instruct, but actually teaches. And hence my mission statement, helping photographers understand, or excuse me, helping photographers develop a better understanding of the hows mm -hmm. and the whys behind making consistently great photographs. And it's really a matter of taking my many years of experience and helping photographers understand the bigger picture. 
it's really traditional in photography to learn a lot of rules, uh, especially rules about composition and rules about lighting. Um, and if you go to an art school, if you like were to go to college for an MFA degree, you learn tons of art rules. But interestingly enough, all the people that they use as examples, the, the grandmaster artists, they had no rules. The rules didn't exist then. Uh, okay. So there's this, this odd contradiction in, in the way that we teach art. We shove rules down people's throat, which the science behind creativity teaches us. Essentially, what you're doing is you're putting people in a box by teaching them all these rules and mm -hmm. these boundaries. And then the challenge is getting outside the box. And only the people that can get far enough outside the box in the most unique manner, they're the only ones that get rewarded as being incredibly creative. So if we'd stop putting people in the box in the first place, we leave the mind open to think more, be freer. So that's really been a big part of my approach and actually why I enjoy it because I do. And full disclosure about this, like I keep kind of referencing psychology. Mm -hmm. I am married to an incredible woman who is a PhD in cognitive psychology. Uh, fortunately for me, she is not a clinical psychologist because I'm sure I'd be in a straitjacket somewhere right now <laughs> in a padded room. But um, when we first met, which was about 20 years ago, um, she would frequently hear me talk about something that I had done in a shoot or, you know, and with my photography and do the typical PhD thing and start explaining the science. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just creativity. <laughs> and it's like, like, don't ruin it. It's not science. You know, uh, fortunately for me, she was very persistent and she really actually opened my eyes up to the fact that we do tend to think of creativity as either you follow the rules or you just think outside the box. Right. And the fact of the matter is, though, we do know a lot of the science behind the way people perceive things and see things and what attracts people to certain things. And one of the things you learn as a photographer, when you take the picture, you have an experience. When you share the picture with someone else, and especially today, social media, no other human being is going to have that same experience. It's, it's impossible. They weren't there. They didn't do it. But interestingly enough, the more you understand about the psychology behind how the brain works, how people perceive things about creativity, you do have the ability to influence the way people will perceive your work. Okay. And so for me, that's been kind of where I've really nerded out in the educational aspect of it and how I really got so deep into creativity and understanding it. And it's really helped me because the other challenge is, is the older we get, the harder it becomes to be creative for one simple reason. We start to develop that been there, done that aspect, seen that before. I know the outcome of that. I know if I do this and this, I'm going to get this. And so it's like we know too much when we're younger and we have that young and dumb element to us. We are more open to things. We're more open to trying ridiculous things because we don't actually know what the outcome is going to right, be. So we right. stumble onto things. The older we get, the harder that is. So yeah. by learning a lot of the science, I've been able to kind of continue to push my boundaries. Okay. So a um, couple questions here. Yeah. Looking at uh, all of this stuff today, what's going on, you talked about the barriers of entering being removed. What mm -hmm. would you recommend? Okay, I'll give you an example. My daughter's 18 years old, just graduated mm -hmm. from high school, still kind of figuring this out. She wants to make a career of these things. What, what, what recommendation would you have for someone like that that's just getting started out of the box looking right. at the way the world is today. Okay. So if she's looking to get into a career in photography, uh, first and foremost, she needs to shoot yeah. every day. Every day. Every day. Um, she doesn't have to know what she wants to shoot for a career. She doesn't have to know, oh, I want to be a portrait photographer, a wedding photographer. Um, and, and if she wants to choose something, even like the landscapes, she should ignore all the people that say, I oh, can't really make a lot of money doing landscapes because in time, anytime I hear somebody say that, I say, listen, go Google the name Peter Lick, L-I-K. He's okay. an Australian photographer who has sold his images for millions of dollars and continues to do so. Wow. So you can make money as a landscape photographer. You can make money as any kind of photographer. It's all about running a business. Right. right. If she's looking to go to some kind of higher education, um, I would encourage her actually not to go to a photography program. Okay. Um, this gets me in trouble with a lot of educators. Um, but 
there's a, a, a reality that colleges deal with and it's not their fault. It's understanding, understandable, mm -hmm. right? Digital technology and computer technology for that matter in, in the big picture of, uh, history, it's still in its infancy. So the problem that colleges have is it's expensive mm -hmm. and it's really hard for them to keep up with the technology in terms of hardware, but also in higher education, especially in the United States, we have this thing called tenure. And for a college professor, they come out of school, they get a job as a professor, they work really hard to get tenure. Right. At that point, you know, good, bad, or otherwise, they are not highly incentivized to keep up with technology. Right. So the technology is moving so fast. These people essentially, they have a day job, which is teach students. Right, right. They have limited time to keep up with the advancements in technology. So college is not the best place to get that education. But here's what college is really great for. So I'm not saying she shouldn't go to college. I'm just saying don't go to college for photography. She should go to college for business and marketing. If she wants to be able to sustain herself in a life of maybe being a portrait photographer or a wedding photographer or running a business, you're not going to do it. And believe me, I am the perfect example because I, I literally, one of the scenarios that I had was walking out of my apartment with a two-year-old son and my wife in the apartment with my car on the back of a flatbed about to be repossessed. And it was the loan <laughs> officer at the bank who showed me empathy, didn't take the car, but he said, here's the deal. You show up in my office tomorrow morning with all of your accounting and you will come back to see me once a month until the loans paid off. We all know most loan officers would not do that today. And very right. few would have done that. Then. No, no, this, you got this, lucky. this gentleman literally taught me how to run a business That's cool. and saved my hide, you know, big time. So without basic business knowledge, it makes the job 50 times harder because obviously no photographer ever bought their first camera, got hooked on photography, became passionate about it, decided I want to be a photographer because they actually wanted to learn business and marketing. Uh, that photographer okay. doesn't exist, right? right? But the fact of the matter is business and marketing skills will make the task much, much easier. Okay. So, yeah, that, uh, she's got a site and that kinds of stuff. So I was interested. So um, what do you see on the horizon for photography where the, the, the barriers to entry have come down? There's new technologies yep. coming up. What do you see on the horizon for that? Well, the big buzzword right now, so the immediate future is AI, artificial intelligence. Okay. Um, it's coming at us in every direction from software that we use for processing to software that we actually use for culling, like picking the best smile out of a group of 10 pictures. Mm -hmm. um, we've got AI coming into the cameras with um, features that are able to identify specific subjects that allow the autofocus in the cameras to be much more accurate, much faster. Wow. I think number one, in the short term, we're going to see much, much more AI, which means the cameras are going to do even more of the work than they're already doing. Wow. Traditionalists, actually most photographers, my generation, unfortunately, I'm not one of them, but traditionalists feel that that's ruining photography. Right. Uh, I don't at all. I think it's outstanding because for me, going back to my middle school days, I got hooked on photography because that shy kid found out that photography gave him access to the world. Right. The camera's like my shield. Yeah. Obviously, I've learned to not be shy at this point. People are like, you're never shy. I'm, I was, and I still instinctively am, but photography is my ticket. So, you know, that was, I didn't get into photography just because of the photography stuff. It was the people aspect. The people. So I think that we see much, much more AI, cameras doing, you know, much, much more of the work. And, and I think from there, it's, it's a matter of um, hopefully, we encourage younger generations mm -hmm. to really explore more and experiment more. Yeah. I've been participating and doing some teaching for um, a company out of Great Britain. They have a program called the Daisy app. And um, this business was actually started, co-founded by Maisie Williams, who is the actress in Game of Thrones. And um, basically what they're trying to do is kind of create an art school online. So this is uh, very young people. Uh, the majority of the membership in this uh, program are like 18 to 26 years old. So 
Um, I've been moderating some discussion rooms in there and doing some workshops, but one of the things that I am seeing with a younger generation of photographers, so I'm talking about the kids that are coming out of high school now and the kids that are going into college now, they are extremely anti-rules. They love film. They love the rawness of film. Yeah. Um, they... <clears throat> Basically, they consider their images great yeah. or not great based on the amount of emotion that's in an image. For photographers that were brought up very traditionally, following those rules of composition and lighting and things like that, they look at so much of what 18 and 20 year olds are producing today and they would call it trash. Sure. And they're so wrong, right? Yeah. Um, just because it doesn't follow all of these traditional rules. When I look at what so many of these younger photographers are doing, I'm incredibly jealous in wow. part because I'm so far down the path on my career. Yeah. I'd be the first to say my work is very commercialized. I, and that's just how my mind is wired. Right. I was going to say it's the mindset of these new kids. It's right. Not that and I see what they're doing the mindset, and yeah. it's outstanding. I, I think it's, it's actually, I'm jealous in the sense that they don't have the boundaries yeah. that, you know, that I was taught, you know, coming, coming through up through the business. And I, and I think it's very exciting. I think it's got a lot of opportunity. Um, so yeah, I, it's definitely going to be a big technology push, but that's going to bring even more people in. And yeah. then once they're in it, it's freeing up more of your bandwidth to really focus on the subject matter in front of you, even if it is a landscape, yeah. but it, it's about finding the ability to, to find something different in that landscape, something unique and something interesting. That's, that's what the technology is, is giving us. And I think we're going to see the cameras themselves you know changed dramatically you mentioned earlier you know the samsung galaxies the the pixel um you know the new iphones what we're we're doing with the smartphones is incredible what they've done to the the camera industry is they've basically taken out the whole bottom end of the camera yeah, market exactly. they used to have all the little exactly. compact cameras right yep, yep. um so we're reaching a, a a kind of a tipping point really where um, you do have quite a few photographers now, well-known photographers who have gotten rid of all their traditional gear and are doing their work exclusively on iPhones. Wow. I don't know that I'm quite ready to make that leap yet, but at the same time, I, for the type of work that I do, in theory, probably about 80% of my work, I could actually do it on a smartphone if I, if I chose to do that. Wow. You know, the smartphones aren't quite to that point where I would actually legitimately consider that yet, but yeah, we're um, getting there. there's a solid argument that, yeah, that it's right around the corner. So I think we're also going to see the gear change a lot. One of the things that's been happening in the last probably 10 years, um, not for Olympus because part of what Olympus is selling point is it's small, right? But Canon, Nikon, Sony, especially as they've, as they've entered into the mirrorless cameras, they're going in the wrong direction. They're big and they're heavy. Like the average lens now for these mirrorless cameras for Canon, Nikon, and Sony is about six pounds, four to six pounds Ooh, for the lens, for the lens, right? Not to mention the camera. Right. So, um, you know, that's going to hit a wall. It yeah. just, we know historically that's going to hit a wall. Think about how, think about how mobile phones were in the 1990s, right? Compared to now, right? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. you know, the original mobile phones that were like a brick that you held yeah. up to your yeah. ear, right? That's right. Uh, in, in the late eighties, right? So, so we always, as, as a species, we always push to make things smaller, faster, lighter. Right. Cameras have been going in the opposite direction. That's going to have to hit a wall. And part of that is obviously this, as the technology is getting better, they're going to be able to do that. But I think we're going to see the camera as we know it and the way it looks and functions. I think we're going to see it start to look very different um, and, and feel very different. They've done some amazing things now uh, with optics, um, actually using liquid where uh -huh. you know they're able to create essentially zoom lenses and focus the lens by squeezing the shape of a liquid bag right right so so we're getting to a point where i do i think we'll, we're going to see a, a big revolution even in the the way we use cameras and how they look and function so um tell me about your podcast when did you start podcasting we we went down a rabbit hole there for a minute yeah uh, no, that's okay technology. so um the podcast started um technically about a year and a half ago but it actually started as a live stream on youtube it was called okay. Podchat. Right. and um i had people like you know can't you just post it as a as a podcast afterwards and i started that at first and then i honestly i stopped it because 
the live stream was about an hour long and yeah. much of the live stream was talking about things that were going on in the chat window and you know, sure. talking about pictures which you can't see in a podcast i'm like this is ridiculous like i i appreciate that some people wanted to listen to it that way but I thought, this is painful yeah so then i also realized you know i've been for a long time wanting to kind of start an interview series where i would talk to photographers not about their careers and how wonderful their life is but about hows and the whys why do you make these decisions how do you sure. make these selections etc and so i thought well let me see if i can you know get enough interest in that and and you know get photographers that would be worth listening to um one of my original concerns was would photographers be willing to be transparent i came up in in a, a generation where you've asked another photographer for advice they just doesn't put a knife in your back and, and i right. was no different i'm not proud of that but i was yeah. no different it was competition you protect your your ip right you know? And, and fortunately, the world's changed a lot in that sense. Uh, it really has. And so I've, I've had very little you know, resistance and pushback, and I've been able to get some great people that have been really transparent, shared some awesome, awesome information. So I, I don't like to tell people this, but really the reason I'm doing it is because I get to geek out and yep. talk to all these great people. And honestly, even at my age, What's cool about it is I can honestly say I come away from these interviews learning things. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. that's awesome. So yeah, that's how I look at this. I've and a lot of times when I pick guests, it's because it's stuff I want to learn. So sure. uh, and yep. you know, you brought up a point that's really interesting. I hadn't, you know, I'm a I'm a technologist, been in it for 34 plus years. I hadn't really thought about AI on cameras, you know, and I, I've yeah. interviewed several AI people and stuff. So mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be interesting to see where things go because, oh, yeah. you know, a, a computer can make far more decisions quicker than a, the human brain. Absolutely. And so uh, there's, really there's so much of it out there at this point. I mean, they have, there are cameras that um, you can set it up so that it won't let you press the button until the person is smiling. It won't let you press the button if the person's eyes aren't open. Wow. Uh, even in like a smartphone, the Google Pixel, you can photograph a group of people you take five or six frames, it's going to find the frames that are best to have everybody's eyes open, wow. things like that. So, yeah, I, I mean, the technology that's coming at us from the AI standpoint, it's what's great about it is it's using, it's using the AI, using this computer technology to essentially solve problems that photographers routinely Routinely, have. wow. You know, even, even just uh, in Photoshop where you're still doing things a little bit more manually, it's incredibly simple now to um, remove things from the background. Is there a mailbox there? Get rid of it. Is there another yeah. person there? Get rid, Get of, rid it, of it. Right. Yeah. And five, just, actually, not even five years ago, three years ago, that was advanced retouching yeah. techniques. Right. Yep. You you had to really understand and know Photoshop. Now a beginner, in most cases, can open up Photoshop and you know, maybe one quick five minute YouTube tutorial, they're gonna be able to pull something out of a background and it's gonna be seamless. And that's yeah. because the software is doing all the heavy lifting. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, I have uh, been a hack uh, graphics type person and those types of things. And I can remember mm -hmm. five, six years ago, I mean, it was like needing a, a mad scientist degree to figure out Photoshop. I mean, yeah. you know, the average <laughs> yep. person would open this up and there'd just be all this stuff and it'd be like, are you kidding me? Really? Sure. You yep. Know, and I've had well, to not to mention there's daughter. a lot of great Photoshop alternatives now too. So oh, yeah. the software's yeah. come it's come a long way. Yeah, yeah you, you even have uh, free stuff like Inkscape and and you know there's a you know a lot mm -hmm. of stuff out there. So it's yeah. it's pretty amazing the world. Yep. Well you've been very transparent. Now oh one other question I had on your podcast. Oh. How frequent do you publish new episodes? Oh every week. Every week. Um, okay. uh, yeah, nine nine out of ten episodes are an interview with okay. uh, a photographer and they're not all famous. Yeah. They are at different aspects of the career. Actually, last week, I interviewed a 22-year-old photographer who is running a very successful elopement photography business in the Pacific oh, wow. Northwest, which is something I didn't even know was a thing. Turns out it's actually been a thing for a bit of a minute so far, but uh, this young woman was absolutely amazing. She was in med school. Decided she really wasn't, her name is Brianna Parks. She really wasn't into medicine. She loved photography. Um, she was married at age 19. Wow. And I'll tell you what, if I had her entrepreneurial sense 
when I was her age, mm -hmm. I'd be in a whole different place right, yeah. right now. Uh, this young woman just absolutely brilliant. I mean, listening to her talk, honestly, even for somebody like me who has learned the lessons the hard way, mm -hmm. it was like listening to a master class in, in being an entrepreneur. She has just done so much of it right. Her photography is brilliant. So, you know, even to speak with somebody that's that young, uh, it's just really, really awesome. Number one, it's inspiring to find somebody with that kind of talent and knowledge. Mm -hmm. But two, just to, you know, see really kind of a very different approach. I mean, let's face it, everybody's got a different reality. We all kind of make our own reality through life. Sure, sure. So it's always fascinating to, you know, be able to learn a little bit and experience about, experience somebody else's reality, even even when you would at face value think it's very similar to yours and you realize no, not at all. I'll have to reach out to Brianna and get her on the, on the program. It'd be interesting. Uh, you know, young woman, there's yeah. uh, some really interesting things. There's interesting trends, you know, both of my daughters, when they got engaged, you know, they had a friend there taking pictures and, you know, doing that. Yep. I mean, there's a whole genre of those types of things. And oh, so, sure. yeah, yep. I mean, and to be able to record those moments and things like that. And then, I can remember back when I got married, just the money we spent on photographers and then videographers, you know, to be yeah. able to record the whole day in, in video and those things. Yep. And so uh, it's a different world. Well, fantastic. I'm going to have to listen in on your podcast and I'm certainly going to push well, this you. over to my daughter because uh, she's aspiring and doing some fun things. And I think that's great. And I think cool. a lot of our listeners would uh, share that out with others. So I have one last question for you that I ask sure. all of my guests. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is a left-handed question. You know, in the okay. Western, Western cultures, we have this thing called a bucket list and the bucket list are all the things we want to do before our time is over. Uh, sure. I've actually interviewed the bucket list guy and he's, that's his website, yeah. the bucket list guy, uh, Trav right. Bell. Anyway, there's that list of things we want to do, but then there's an opposite. There's always an opposite, everything in the world. And that's a list of things we don't want to have anything to do with or don't want or have no desire. Now, that list right. rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, but I'm not yeah. going to say that because it's a family <laughs> show. So I'm going to ask you what might be a thing or two on your F it list. And I'll give you a couple examples from me. I'm never going to have a collection of pet snakes. Just not going to yeah. happen. Uh, <laughs> I'm not interested in eating any more um, sardines, caviar, or monkey brains. None of those are sound appealing. Or a big trend in the South and Southeast Asia now is these insect uh, cafes. Uh, oh, yeah. No. Nah, not going to do that. And then the one that I actually did uh, a few, gosh, years back, I did an episode on it is I will never, ever again do a Lakota Sioux sweat lodge. So the, the concept oh. of uh, okay. excessive heat, excessive humidity, excessive yep. drumming, excessive um, chanting, and a slice of nudity, not yeah. going to do it. <laughs> so what might be an item or two that's on Joe's F wow. effort list? Uh, well, I mean, like you, I'm, I'm definitely not a reptile or insect guy, it, yeah. whether they're dead or alive. That's really not my thing. Um, gosh, I, you know, <coughs> wow, you really got me stumped there, Rex. I mean, off well, the top well, of my I'll, head. I'll tell you what, Joe, the next time you ever hear someone talk about a bucket list, you're going to yeah. remember this conversation. I know for sure. I, I'll admit, I mean, I mean, there, there, there's nothing that honestly, there's nothing that comes to the top of my mind. It's kind of like, no, never. Um, I, I mean, I will say this one thing, um, when, when it comes to, um, certain things like, um, outdoorsy things, especially weather related things, mm -hmm. um, big part of the reason why I am not like a landscape or nature or wildlife photographer, those are three categories that that make me very religious. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer that if, if God had meant for us to spend all that time out in the freezing cold in, in, in the wilderness and all that, he wouldn't have made nice, comfortable beds and air conditioners yes. yeah. and, and heaters. So those are things that, yeah, you, you definitely won't see me doing much of for sure. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the, the comforts of, um, you know, air conditioners and beds and all those yes things. yeah i have a good friend that always says you know with all the developments in the modern world why do i and he talks about camping why do i want to go pretend that i'm homeless for three three or four days right so. i i'm 100 with you on that one yep all right well thank you yeah. joe it's been awesome to get to know you hear your story uh, a lot of valuable information how can people get a hold of you 
best place is to start with my website, okay. www.joeedelman.com. Uh, okay. From there, you'll find not only tons of articles and videos, but it's home base for Talk Chat, as well as The Last Frame. And of course, all my social links are there as well. Fantastic. You've been an awesome guest. It's been great to know you. So uh, we'll say the things that we always say at the end of every episode. Uh, we're thankful everybody tuned in. And then also pr- please visit uh, our website so you can get the latest and greatest. So until next time, don't forget these things. Be bait, excuse me, be safe, but be bold and make it a great day.